Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Now today I'm going to take some old pine floorboards that I found at a salvage yard and I'm going to turn them into an instant antique chimney cupboard. Now I found the inspiration for the chimney cupboard from a visit to a wonderful collection and I'll take you there next right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Have you ever noticed that when you visit a really first-class antique shop that the pieces that you'd really like to have are not for sale? That's because they belong to the owner or the dealer and he's not going to sell them. We happen to be in the home of an antiques dealer and he has a house filled with antiques that you can't buy. You can't buy this leather sofa, a 1940 Chesterfield sofa. He won't sell you this painted rocking chair that dates to 1810. And don't even think about asking about this Chippendale mirror that dates to 1770. Now out here in the front hall of this new house that's meant to look old is a nice staircase that goes up and splits to both sides of the house, a nice grandfather's clock, and collections everywhere. Stoneware vessels and a whole collection of stoneware ink pots. Now we are here to look at a piece that's in the kitchen this shaker chimney cupboard from Canterbury, New Hampshire, original in every detail. Inside, we can see that it's very useful for storage here in the kitchen. The door has some nice details, flat panel on the inside, raised panel on the outside, very little decoration, a slight bead around the panel, and a slight bead on the rails and styles. The only other decoration is the half round cutout on the sides. Now I know I'm going to have to come back to the shop and build this because I know this fella isn't going to sell it to me. Well, I wish I could have brought home that whole collection. But I did manage to bring this home, the chimney cupboard. Well, not really. I brought home the idea. Looks like an antique, doesn't it? I built it yesterday. The key is in the wood. It was made from antique boards. And what that allows me to do is when I get to the finish stage, I can put on a clear finish, an oil or a wax, and I get this wonderful patina of the pine. Now it doesn't make sense to build a piece like this and remove all the defects in the wood. So I've left this nail hole in the panel, some putty that was used to fill a hole. Over here there was a big nail hole and a stain. I left the stain but put a little Dutchman in. Down here in the lower panel, these worm holes, they're just great. And inside the door, if you look at the lower rail, I even made that with a piece of wood that was showing some signs of dry rot. All these things add a lot of character to the piece. But the key is in the boards. Now, I obtained my boards from a salvage yard that collects old houses. They sell off some of the trim and the hardware, but their big inventory is in antique floorboards. If you look at the back of this board, you can see that the saw marks go straight across. That means this was either sawn in a pit saw or with an old water saw. Some of these boards could be over 200 years old. Now, if you'd like to build a chimney cupboard with either new material or some old boards, a measure drawing is available, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, let's get started. Now, these four boards should be enough to make the sides of the cupboard. And the first thing that I want to do is knock out any bits of metal, for instance, nails or screws. Because if I don't get rid of those, I could do some serious damage to my tools. Next, I want to run my boards through my surface planer. But before we do any planing, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now what I want to do is plane all the boards to a uniform thickness. I don't want to take the material off the face side, that's where the patina is. I want to take it off the back side. I'm going to plane all the boards until they're 7 eighths of an inch thick.
Well, now I've got everything to a uniform thickness. So now I want to make a pass on the face side, removing about a sixteenth of an inch to take away the dirt. Now let me show you what happens if you take too much off with the surface planer. Here's the back side of the board where a quarter of an inch was removed. It looks almost like brand new pine. But on the face side where less than a sixteenth of an inch was removed, we still have that old look. Now the next thing I want to do is glue these boards into panels so I have to straighten the edges where they meet. With the boards straight and square, I want to keep them that way by joining them together using some glue and biscuits. Of course, these biscuits combined with the glue will swell up and you'll never get this joint apart. While those panels dry, I want to start preparing the stock for the face frame and the door. The face frame overlaps the side, and it wouldn't be acceptable to have a freshly sawn edge right along this point. So what I've done is selected a board that has good edges, and I'll just scrape off the dirt and lightly pass it over the joiner. From this side of the board, I'll cut this style. From the other side of the board, which also has a good edge, I'll cut this style. And from the center, I'll make the styles for the door. That way I'll have pieces of wood that are similar in texture and color. Now with the joiner set at no more than a 32nd of an inch, I'm going to clean that edge. The two long pieces here are the styles of the door, and these three short pieces are the rails. The next thing I want to do is joint the edges and rip them to the correct width. I'll square the ends on the pieces and cut them to length at my power miter box. As you may recall, the antique original had a raised panel in the door. But as soon as you cut a raised panel in this antique wood, you expose fresh wood, and that's not acceptable. So I've decided to use a flat panel, which is very common and quite acceptable. It's about a quarter of an inch thick, and it sits in a groove in the rails and styles. I've set up at my table saw my stack dado head cutter with the two outer blades, which gives me a quarter inch width. I've set the height to 5 eighths of an inch, and I've adjusted the rip fence so that the groove will be right in the center of each piece. Let's take another look at the prototype. The rails and styles of the door are joined with mortise and tenon joinery, and the tenons go all the way through so that they show. This is a very common characteristic of old doors. To make the mortises, I'm going to use my stationary mortiser, which I've set up with a quarter inch chisel and the drill bit that removes most of the material. But since this chisel will only cut to a depth of about an inch and three quarters, and my style is three and a half inches wide, I'll have to make half the cut from this side and finish it from the other side.
To make the tenons that are on the ends of the rails, I've set up my stack dado head cutter at a three quarter inch width and a quarter inch height. I've set a stop lock so that'll determine where the shoulder cut is to be formed. And using my miter gauge, I can make the shoulder cut, then nibble away the rest of the material. The bandsaw is the ideal tool for finishing the tenon. This is known as a haunched tenon. This portion right here fits into the groove of the style, and of course this portion goes through the mortise. Okay, now I've got all the mortise and tenon joints for the door frame fitted together, but before I can assemble it, I have to make the panels. These are the two boards that I'm going to make the panels from, and I have to plane them down to a quarter of an inch thick. To square up the ends and cut the panels to length, I'm going to use my homemade panel cutter. That way I'm sure that the ends are square. Now I've got to move fairly quickly here before the glue sets up. All right, now let's fit the panels. Now these just get slipped in dry, no glue. Now look at that panel for character, all those great wormholes. Well, it looks like we're going to make it. All right, one door. We'll set it aside to dry, and we'll easily finish this project tomorrow. I started today by working on the sides of the cupboard. And if I spin it around so that you can see the back, you'll notice that I've milled a rabbit along the back edge of each side panel. And that's to conceal the backboard so that you don't see them from the side of the cupboard. I started by sizing the panels that I glued up yesterday. I jointed an edge, ripped them to width, squared them, and then cut them to length. To mill the rabbits, I set my table saw up with my stack dado head cutter for a little over three quarters of an inch in width. And I attached this scrap piece of plywood to my metal rip fence to protect the dado. I've set the height at three eighths of an inch, and now I'm ready to mill the rabbit. Now let me tip the cupboard down onto a sawhorse so I can show you the top details. The top edge of each side panel also receives a rabbit so that the top can sit in it. Now I can make that rabbit using the same setup that I have at the table saw. The only thing I have to do is reduce the depth of the cut to a quarter of an inch.
Now the shelves of the cupboard sit in dados, and I can make those dados using the same type of setup at the table saw. Well, let's start assembling. First, the top piece, which will get glued and nailed in place with some four penny finish nails. All right, now for one of the shelves. I think I'll put a clamp on this side to make sure the shelf is tightly pushed into the dado. Now using my framing square, I can make sure that the shelf is square to the side because if the glue starts to set, I won't be able to move it later. Now notice how I'm going to nail these. I'm going to toenail down from the inside. That way, there'll be no nails on the outside of the cabinet that show. And now for the bottom shelf. Now there's no way to install this side of the cupboard without gluing all the dados at once. Now the back of the cupboard is made up of just a couple boards nailed on with no glue. Now I've just milled a very tiny groove along the edge of one of my styles. And to do that, I used a router bit, which I reground the profile on to give me just that tiny, tiny groove. And what that's for is so that I can get this bead detail that runs around the rails and styles. I'll sand the rest of it to ease the edges. Where the rails meet the styles, I want to have a nice miter joint to let the bead go around the corner. To do that, I have to perform a couple things. I have to remove the bead from the style and then make a slight miter cut at the bead. And on the rail, I simply have to miter the bead area so that when the two come together, that's the effect. First, I have to rip off the bead to the miter point. Now I've tipped my blade to 45 degrees, and using my miter gauge, I can complete the cut. Now to attach the face frame to the cabinet, I'm gonna use just biscuits and glue. I don't want any nails to show. Now this cutout detail we found on the original and we wanted to include it on our version. Old time carpenters were masters at repairing damaged wood. These patches were often referred to as Dutchman. In those days the carpenter would have used a sharp chisel to remove the damaged material and then carefully fitted a patch. Today I can use power tools and a template. I have this hardwood template with the classic bow tie shape cut out of it. I've installed a couple pieces of double stick tape and that'll hold the template in place over the damaged area. 
Now the power tool will be the router and I've installed a collar and then it has a straight cutting spiral bit to remove the material. To make the patch, I'm using a piece of scrap wood that's similar to the original. I've put new double stick tape on the template and I'll just set it in place. To cut the patch, I'm going to use the same router, but I'm going to remove this outer collar. To remove the patches, I'm going to use my table saw to slice through the scrap. The sharp corners of the patch have to be rounded over to fit into the cutout and once that's done, I can add a little glue and spread it around on the edges. Carefully tap the patch into place with a scrap piece of wood. And then just sand everything flush. The door is going to pivot on a couple small brass hinges and I want to mortise the hinges into the door and into the face frame and that's very easy to do. I start out by holding the hinge where I want it, then taking a sharp mat knife, score the outline of the hinge. Now to remove the material for the mortise, I'm going to use my router, which I've set up with a half inch straight cutting bit, and freehand the area, staying just shy of those score marks. the rest of the material, I'm just going to use a sharp chisel. Okay, let's try the fit. That's good. Now with the hinges installed, we're ready to start thinking about finishing this project. All I really need to protect this piece is a couple coats of a Danish oil finish. Applied straight from the can, I'll let the first coat dry about 45 minutes and then apply a second coat. And once in a while I'll put some wax on it to maintain the finish. But what I really like about this oil is that it brings out all the characteristics of the wood. The wormholes, the knots, and any other defects. Well, now that the oil has dried, you can really see the beauty of the antique pine boards. The original chimney cupboard at the antique dealer's house was being used sort of as a pantry, a place for the cornflakes and the cans of cat food. But the more I look at this piece, I think it belongs in my bedroom, where I can store my vast collection of plaid shirts and my growing collection of sweatshirts. That looks just about right. Well, until next time when I hope that you and I can build yet another woodworking project, I'm Norm Abram from the New Yankee Workshop. <laughs>